Rock Talk shows off her newfound science knowledge. Janeway snaps the diviner's tubes of Ketracel purple. And Yord Slot and Trodo can finally communicate. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton and Bonnie Gordon. Hello, hello. Hi. Today, we are joined by the showrunners of Star Trek Prodigy. Can you believe it? Put your virtual hands together for Kevin and Dan Hageman. This is where... <laughs> this is, we did it. Yeah, this is the impost. There are going to be a big... Air horns uh, and then applause uh, and fed confetti bombs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's, There's somebody so getting thrown off the stage for jumping on the stage. Uh, we're doing a review <laughs> of Prodigy's season one, episode 10, which is the mid season finale entitled A Moral Star, part two, directed by Ben Ebon. Uh, well thank done. you for telling us how to spell Perfect. that. Well that. Mm -hmm. uh, well How's done. everybody doing? We're fantastic. I mean, we are so excited. We've been sitting on this episode for two years, and now that it's out, we are so excited to talk about it. Oh, and we're just, you know, the, the first way for us to figure out, oh my gosh, do people like it, is like we're on Twitter, just looking at like those people yes. who are staying up at midnight mm -hmm. and watching it. And so I'll wake up the next morning and I'm like... Ah, uh, sigh of relief. Like, okay. <laughs> do the three of you, you must do that, right? Uh, I know Aaron does it, right? At, at 11 p.m. Pacific time, do you go on Twitter and just start soaking up the adulation and it just keeps coming? <laughs> it, yeah, it's a Wednesday night ritual where like you're sleeping and then anytime you're kind of stirring awake, you're like, well, let's see how many people like it now. <laughs> <laughs> And then there was that one time where it was wasn't on Paramount Plus, and I was as upset as everybody else. I'm like, "Where's yeah. the, where, where's the tweets? It, it's it's not getting out there." <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I remember that. I I just want to tell you guys directly because you know you need to hear it from from the horse's mouth. I think that this show that you've created, this prodigy show, in my humble opinion is the best of the new Star Trek shows that are out on television, um, available on Paramount Plus. I love this show. I think you've uh, really hit it out of the park. And what I really like is how you're introducing Star Trek to the young generation and making it about life lessons, about uh, setting goals, about learning and discovering and exploration um, from a very, uh, intelligent, well thought out point of view. So I just want to congratulate you guys on the work that you've been doing so far. I think this this show has started out, and in my opinion, is the best of of what the new Star Trek um, shows out there on the on the on the slate. Thank I mean, I that. agree, but I'm a little biased. But I I agree, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and that ship. Mm. I mean, I can speak for Kevin and I, there's a massive amount of trepidation when you have this responsibility of creating a show that's an entry point. Mm. And it scared Kevin and I, and we're like, are we the right people to do this? And I think, you know, once you find a way in and it's a story that excites you, and once you find people to help you, like, you know, the, the, the writers that we have on staff, the, you know, finding Benny Bond and finding finding Bonnie, you start getting like a little clubhouse game and you're, guys, and you're <laughs> like, guys, we're making a Star Trek show. How awesome is that? Mm -hmm. And I wanna, I, wanna give, I wanna give kudos to Kevin. Kevin, like first day in the writer's room, he's like, let's make this about joy. Like, let's, let's make this a joyful experience. And anytime that's like, we're, we're, that doesn't mean it's not gonna be tough. And like, we are hard on the writers. We are hard on each other. We are trying to make everything the best possible it can be, but like, don't forget, we're making a Star Trek show. Like, how awesome is that? And so we, we hope we're glad that that's coming through to the audience. You know, that's it exactly is. the word I was going to use. Um, last night, when I was watching uh, the new episode, and I found myself a little sad that this is the last one we're going to have for several months. And I was thinking, what is it that is making this such a good experience for me watching this and covering this and talking about this? 
And it's just, I came to the conclusion, it's just a joyful experience. It just mm-hmm. makes me happy. It's, it's easy to digest. It's fun. It's positive, but it's not like silly, you know, bubblegum trash. It's, it's really, it, it's kind of like what we needed without knowing that we needed it. It brings joy to my life. It brings joy to other people's lives and talking about it is a joyful experience. And I'm truly going to miss, you know, this time with Sorok and Bonnie and the people that you have on your show and your amazing writer's room of what, nine people. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just been a joyful experience. I just want to personally thank you for this gift. I know you didn't make it for me, but (laughs) as a fan, still, (laughs) thank you. What do you mean? Of course it's made for you. It's made oh, for everyone. So me. Seriously. Well, I mean, not, you know, <laughs> you personally, but again, it's made, I feel that's, what's been the most fun for me is seeing all my friends, you know, I'm, you know, in my mid thirties with no kids, but I'm like the crazy aunt to all my friends, children. <laughs> and also, you know, my, my baby sister just had a child. Uh, so I, I have a nephew now. And the fact that I can share this show with them is make, makes it so like, it's a piece of my not just of so much a piece of my heart because Star Trek is such an important part of my life, but it, it becomes personal now. And now, and it's something that's teaching them important lessons, but also it's fun for them. And then they get to hear Aunt Bonnie talking. So it's just such a fun thing to share with all ages. And, and my friends started watching it with their kids, you know, just to make sure like what's going on. And now they're more, they're, they're more excited about watching it than the actual kids are. So mm-hmm. I, I really think that you've created a show that just really speaks to everyone of all ages and whether they love Star Trek or know nothing of Star Trek, everyone can find something they enjoy from it and find joy with, within the community talking about it. So thank you for that. Thank you guys. I mean, I think when we first started, we really wanted, you know, our entry point in was the Wrath of Khan. And for me, that experience was really emotional. That finale Mm -hmm. to Wrath of Khan is so powerful. And I think we wanted to, to bring that, you know, like a lot of Star Trek, the format, they have to, it's a one hour and whatever Mm -hmm. they go through by the end, they pretty much need to be a similar type of character because they're doing so many episodes and it's not, you know, 100% serialized some of the older um, series. And so Mm -hmm. we, you know, we got to really, you know, these are kids who are growing up, they have to change, you know? And so um, I, I, when we came at this, we just really wanted to bring, bring the emotions, you know, we wanted this to be not just for your mind, but for your heart, you know, even more so than a lot of the other series. Yeah, it is a definitely a feel a feels good story. I have a 10 year old daughter and I mentioned this before while reviewing this show that if I was to try to get her into Star Trek, I would sit her down and watch Prodigy. Watch this show first before you learn about Kirk and and Spock and and all of that. This is probably a good introduction for you to get let you know what Starfleet is about, what the science Mm -hmm. is about. And I feel like you do a very good job of explaining that um, in a very um, sophisticated way. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. You treat the audience who, you know, are are kids in in most cases, but also adults like me. But you treat us like we're smart. You don't talk. Yeah. You know, it's not like a dumb. And I like that about that. You know, (laughs) talk, talk like, you know, give us give us some education, but also assume that we can comprehend it once you give it to us. And I think that's what you do very well on the show, um, explaining things, you know, visual diagrams of, 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 of how things work. Um, you do that a lot in, this, in these shows. And I, I think it's very good mm-hmm. for children to learn, learn about science and become passionate about, you know, exploring and, and, and teamwork, team building, character building, resolving past issues with family and, your own personal issues of growing and development, all the things that I think you cover very well in this uh, series. I have a question for you. <clears throat> what kind of um, what kind of room did you have to create this show in the beginning, working with uh, Nickelodeon? Were there any parameters mm-hmm. or restrictions that they put on you, or were you able to kind of do as you please? No, we actually, I mean, we came up with the idea of the show before Nickelodeon was involved. 
Um, so we, it was very early in the process. We had an idea of what we wanted the show to be essentially about misfit kids, not knowing what they're doing in the galaxy on a ship that they've taken. Um, and then, and, and Brian Robbins called Alex Kurtzman and, and Alex mentioned what the show was and Brian Robbins sight on the scene said, I want it. This is, this sounds fantastic. And we said, I remember when we had that first meeting, we kind of warned them. We're like, this isn't the, the typical Nickelodeon show. And Brian's like, I love it. Let's, let's, let's do it. We want it. I remember David Staff had, uh, he was he's at CBS was in this pitch and he's like, I thought this was going to be a kid's show. It's like, this is amazing. And so, <laughs> and, and to us, it's like, we've never viewed, I always view like, you know, you look at Finding Nemo, that is a movie that moves you as an adult. Is that a kid's mm, movie? I'm like, totally. no, it's, it's, to me, it's like, if you're, honest about emotions and you're not afraid to like you know you don't want to you don't want to throw stuff at kids and try to make mm -hmm. them cry and things like that but if you but if you you know if 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 they give you a little trust and you go don't worry we're going to get through this we may go through some darker things but we're going to have positive uh morals we're going to we're gonna, our hearts are going to be in the right place i think that's when it becomes powerful and then that's, I think you get a little of that Pixar aspect of it. Um, that's to me when I, I'm, I'm watching something and it transcends television and it, you know, it, it's something that just moves you. And, and those are always the moments that I'm like, anytime I'm listening to pitches, I'm like, why does this, how do we make this move people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. first 15 minutes of Up is a perfect example of that. It's like you it want is. to it's show how you can make something for children, but also just, you know, yeah. make or, make adults ball up and cry. Or JJ's truck, oh, you know, the first 2009. 15 minutes of that. I was just yeah. bawling and I was like, oh my gosh. You know, and, and then and then when 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 it when it gets in your heart, it's like you can go anywhere. The jokes are funnier, mm -hmm. the character, everything just shines. It's like, you know. Yeah, I, I'm glad you said it, it because, you know, usually I think of Nickelodeon, I think of SpongeBob, I think of Dora the Explorer. There's <laughs> kind of a, a certain level of kid, kid, kid friendly stuff that I assume, you know, and I attach mentally with Nickelodeon. But when I saw this, I'm like, whoa, this is like DreamWorks. This is Pixar. This is like this is like really almost film quality television right now that i'm watching and i felt like it's film quality uh even the the, the writing and and the actual production of it um can, and, can, I, and just, what, can, I, can I just interject yeah. what you said there like i'm so proud of our team like our team like a pixar movie a dreamworks movie uh like i just heard like i enjoy watching the tv show arcane it's gorgeous oh it's mm -hmm. beautiful it's yeah. gorgeous their budget the amount of years they spent on that is 10 times, what, 10 we times have. Mm -hmm. what we have our budget is so small our no, it's not small but it's not as big as it looks <laughs> like it's it, yeah. no right. but what it looks like what our team managed to do you know mm -hmm. um a lot of our crew we have a lot of young bloods we have a lot of young people who love trek who are um you know so it's not like we're a bunch of veterans uh, you know animators and this or that we're they're young we have like a scrappy young and hungry, hungry. crew they're hungry. and hungry and they're working their tails off and i'm just like floored when i see our finished product mm -hmm. it's just what we're able to do with with the resources and the people that we have it's stunning I'm so proud of them absolutely i think the the pace is also another thing that is is something i want to commend you on I feel like I'm watching it. I'm getting a whole lot of stuff in a very short amount of time. And, I, mm. and I'm like, this, is this an hour long compacted into 25 minutes? Because it feels like an hour worth of things that I'm having to process. And also really quickly, when I watch the show, every single time the opening credits come on, mm. I never, I never press the skip. I wanted to bring that up too. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Do you guys get I as pumped as we do play. for that theme oh, yeah. song? Yeah. I get oh, so freaking you know, pumped like, every time I hear it. Come in. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 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 Dun, I get goosebumps dun, every dun, time. Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. It's even cooler for us because we're like, yeah. that's our show. That's what we geek out. We're yeah. like, oh my God. Yeah. I, I love the opening music. It just literally it gets me kind of hyped up for the show. So 
I let it play every single time. Me too. And I even skip my own opening credits, you know, when I'm watching Space <laughs> I Nine. Know, I, Space Nine too. <laughs> uh, even, even though my name is in it and I could be watching it, I'm like, all right, it's a little slow. Let me get past that and move on. But with yours, it's like, it's just the right amount of time. It doesn't go on too long. And then boom, right into the episode. So kudos mm-hmm. again, and, and I, just for the total production. And kudos. I don't, have you guys heard the full length version of it that you can get? No. You can listen to it. It there's my, Michael Giacchino did it. And what you're hearing is really just the back half. The first half is this gorgeous moving like sort of Slow sweet run. that you hear. And then it builds into that, dun, 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 you know, and so go to like iTunes or wherever and listen to the opening theme. It's the twice as long and it's so moving at the beginning. You're like, oh, it sounds like a, it sounds like a Pixar movie. It sounds like a beautiful, like just, and then it builds into that. And it, it gives the whole picture of the show. I think. Yeah. Wow. I, I think of a theme park when I, when I hear it, I think of a theme park as if I'm on a ride. So I, it's like, I'm ready for, you know, someday. Yeah. Yes. It's the right. <laughs> Star ride. Trek Land. Proto, Star to Trek to Land. Jump, to proto jump. Yeah. And goes here. Come on. That'd be crazy. Oh my gosh. Oh, mm-hmm. um, also, the cast. You guys have really cast some amazing voice actors for this show. Um, I love the work that Dal is doing starring in this show. I think right. he's fantastic. Um, just this performance, he just resonates right through the uh, script. And, and, and as well as the other people, Rock Talk and, and, and Jankum and, you know, all of these characters. Um, and the ship's computer. An exceptional job. And the ship's computer. And the ship's computer. <laughs> and the ship's computer. <laughs> no, I feel like Brett Gray, Brett Gray, I think, yeah. got the job as he was walking in to do the audition. I feel mm. like when he came in, we're like, who is this kid? And like, we didn't, I think we had our eye on somebody else. And he came in and just said, I think he was, came in barefoot and he just started talking. And we're like, this guy, I just love his voice. Like, it just makes me happy. Mm-hmm. You know? He's and infectious. You know, yeah. Yeah. He's infectious. Yeah. And we're like, this is our kid. This is great. And he gives it, off, he can give off that um, cocky, you know, um, attitude without coming off as too much, you know? I always say, you know, I looked back on one of these podcasts and I just repeat myself so much on that, on those words, but I feel like he really nails giving him that cocky attitude and that teenage arrogance without it being too over the top where you can't stand him. Uh, He puts so much heart into it that you actually kind of sympathize with him in the end. And then you, as you watch his character grow, you, you become proud of him and his growth as it happens. Well, those quiet moments. I love when I see, you know, he's usually loud and brash, you know, but Mm -hmm. when you get those quiet little moments with him, he's so good. Brett is so good. Such a moment with Spock. Yeah, Ella Purnell too. Like that, we went through a lot yeah. of school. I mean, Bonnie was up for for Gwen, and she was. I think she, Bonnie, you're you know this. You're in the top, top. I mean, we have something about we love smoky voices. Bonnie has. Yeah, us. I got that mm. low smoky voice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, Ella, yeah. And Ella Purnell, she just has so much vulnerability in in mm-hmm. her voice, it just and and also so much strength when she wants it. And I love seeing that Ella Purnell is everywhere this year with yellow jackets and arcane. She's like, I oh. know, she's killing it. I was <laughs> um, as she's soon as in I yellow heard... jackets. What's she doing in yellow yeah. jackets? She's one of the she's, actresses. Uh, the main, in yellow one of the main gal. Yeah, she's yeah, she's the main gal. Uh, I don't know. Are you watching Yellow Jackets? Oh yeah. It's great. Yeah, she's the uh, Very well the captain of the team. The uh, the dude. Really? Guy. Yeah, that's Ella. Wow, that's awesome. I did not connect mm. that voice, but now I can hear it. Yeah, and you, I, I love that you mentioned vulnerability because her character is this strong character. This, you know, she's got some a little bit of anger, some strength, some some fierceness. Mm-hmm. She's a she's kind of a fighter. You know what I mean? But the fact that she laces it with vulnerability is what brings the charm to that character and what really layers the character because you can write it all you want and the, the, the artist can create it all they want. But if the voice doesn't have that little bit of, you know, whatever little piece of emotion you want it laced with, it's not going to mm-hmm. hit the same way. And I, I love that she does that. And I love that, Every single freaking one of them does something great like that, uh, including Murph. He, 
yeah. you can tell how, well, how Murph is feeling. <laughs> you know, you can, I don't know what you guys write on the script. Trilling sound. We thought we were just going to get walrus sounds. We thought we we're like, well, let's just get walrus sounds because we wanted it to sound real. And then, you know, we met D. Bradley Baker and we're like, this guy is nuts in the best way possible. Mm. And he makes Murph sound yeah, so much cuter that way. Sorry, Sir. It's, it's so <laughs> yeah, it's super cute. Uh, and Zero, we learned a whole lot about kind of. In, we right. didn't learn a lot about, but we learned we learned something about Zero that was kind we of saw, impressive yeah. in, in this episode. Like, whoa, uh, that was impressive for me. But you guys took a took an unconventional route and decided to start the show in a place outside of what we normally see. Cause you know, we normally start a Star Trek show on a Star Trek ship or station or, you know, right. it's functioning, going, and we're just kind of boom, we're in the, we're in the middle now watching them mm -hmm. go through their experience. This started outside of, of it. And we, you know, we didn't even get into it right away. It was like, took a couple episodes to, yeah. you know, find the ship and, and even operate it. And uh, I love that you took this opposite approach even though it's not technically the conventional star trek way um was that difficult for you i mean i think we wanted to make sure that the trek fan was on an even playing field as a six-year-old who knew nothing and we wanted to start them in a place where like if 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 we're just pandering to trek fans that's not the point that's not going to grow mm -hmm. star trek we want to embrace the truck frame we, it's like we're always we want an equal parts old and new um you know fresh story along with with you know old chestnuts old star trek chestnuts and things like that and i think that's the way we want to make sure that we're honoring the new more more than we're honoring the old because this mm -hmm. is going to live and die on dal's and and gwyn's and this and the prodigy crew's shoulder this the, yeah. the show is about them it's like we, we always have moments where like yes we love janeway but we can't have her save the day every time. They've got mm -hmm. to save themselves. Mm -hmm. She can help. She can help. <laughs> she can help. Yeah. But yeah, she and brings more, the uh, coffee. More to Sirak's <laughs> point, though, like it really is the first Star Trek series that doesn't start in the Federation. Mm -hmm. And I, I've kind of wondered if that's like, was that always the plan? Or were you thinking of something else and then you kind of just followed that string of thought and thought later? Well, what if we start it way out over here? Oh, it was always the plan, you know, that we just, you know, it's intimidating. Star Trek is becoming so big. <laughs> How do you, you know, we wanted to take baby steps. We wanted to start in a place where you can like just specialize and have each episode yeah. just focus on one great thing about Star Trek and dive into it and let the kids soak it in and understand what it is like what is a transporter you know and enjoy that and let that episode sort of be about that you know so mm -hmm. that was that was from day one we knew we wanted to do that and i don't know it it, it, Old. it made it we just knew like not only was it a great way for kids to learn but it was so great i thought as a trek fan to re uh to re-engage and to be reintroduced to the things I love that I usually take mm. for granted. Right? Rediscover it through a kid's eyes. Yeah, we're rediscovering what we love about Star Trek through a first timers or through like an innocent's eyes who've never been, who's never yeah. been shown this world before. And it's like, we're getting to discover it for the first time as well. It's like well, going well, to Disneyland with a child who's never been before and yeah. seeing the magic in their eyes, discovering all these things for the first time. That's how I feel when I see people's reactions to Prodigy and, and, and you know, pictures of children watching the television set, just their eyes enamored and learning all the different terms. It's just so fun to see how much they're engaged with it. It's also freeing as a writer because I feel like you kind of know what Starfleet's going to do in a situation of like, let's say first contact. We'll, we're mm -hmm. like our, our crew can mess, mess up the whole episode as, as, <laughs> and then learn the lesson, you know? It's like, and so yeah. we're not beholden to, to doing things the right way or, you know, they can do mm -hmm. things the wrong way, but they can find their way to the right way. Right. They should try it the yeah, same way. They, they could try the same way. <laughs> Sure. We actually um, this this first ten episodes.
episodes out of them, which I all, I like them all, but my particular favorite one was the one that Aaron uh, Waltke wrote. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. Kobayashi episode. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think it, it, it has all of the elements when I look for, and this show in general has all the elements that I look for. Uh, one of them most importantly is the characters. Do I believe the characters? Do I buy the characters? And do I also believe the relationship between the characters? Um, and and I'm, I've been sold now on these characters that you've given us. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to learn more about the little kitty cat that yeah, it's pretty deadly. When <gasps> I've been waiting for that cat to join the crew, I'm still waiting. I'm yeah. like, I swear, one yeah. of these days, that little kid is going to join the cat, crew. No, the cat has its own crew now. It's so funny with with Twitter going hashtag save the Cation. I was like, that Cation doesn't need saving. That Cation can kick. Yeah. That Cation yeah. kicks save major butt. Yeah, yeah, right. That's a very yeah. meta writing joke, though. Save the cat. Mm. Yeah, save like the it. cat. Totally. Save the cat. Save the Cation. When we did yeah. that, when we meet Gwen, you're yes, like, exactly. she saved the cat in the pilot. Mm-hmm. Like how, that's why you love her. She's the daughter mm-hmm. of the bad guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and that's, that, those are the layers to me that make things good because they're dynamic. There's, there's layers there. It's not just one mm-hmm. thing. You see Dal wrestling with his personal, like, you know, what he wants to do and then what he has to do for, for the group, right? And also each one of them having to wrestle that. I, I find myself kind of yelling at Gwen sometimes, like, don't trust him. He's lying. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps doing it to you. Stop listening to him. He's going to lead you in the wrong way. But she wants him to love her. her. It's classic. It's like, right. it's, it's, yeah. but then it's I want funny, her to, but yeah. you buy it, you yeah. know? Look, we, we all have yeah. daddy issues, okay? We all, we all issues. buy it. We all buy it. <laughs> Yeah. But that's that's the beauty of it is that there's it's not just like, OK, this is the guy who's a good guy and this is the dummy and this is the you know, it's like, no, these are layered people. they all have mm. uh, layers. They have issues, you know, um, rock talk, like the development in rock talk, you know, oh. having exp- experienced that learning process in that in that time bubble. Um mm the growth that we see, you know, I, I love the line where he was, uh, Jankum was like, new plan, Jankum holds the door yeah. and you do all you, that stuff. <laughs> you do that stuff that you just, I don't even know, I don't even want to repeat it, you know? I loved it. Um, and so to me, the combination of the good character writing and then these stories, these Star Trek-like stories that make you question, you know, time or, or what's right or what's wrong, you know, morality, um, you know, these these are the kinds of stories that that Star Trek tells so good. And I think mm-hmm. that you guys are just hitting out of the park in this first half of the first season of this show. And and I, I'm just I'm really uh, pleased by it. I'm really pleased. Thank you. <laughs> and Thank you. it's one of my favorite things about villains is when you discover why they do what they do and you realize there's always an uh, element of truth and good to what they think they're doing. And I love how the diviner, you know, through this whole series is made to be this big baddie. And then you find out why he does the things he does and why he chooses right. the, you know, the path he did. And you realize it comes from actual good intentions and the, you know, he's trying to save his, save people, his people, save his kind. And yeah. it's, I feel like that's always the best formula for a strong villain and and you guys once again you know knock it out of the park in the sense that you don't want to sympathize with him but you have you know a part of you does you you know there's always that oh gosh how how do we balance this out you know technically he's not wrong but he's not right and and that's and that's what kids need to learn too the the good and bad you know there's a lot of people sometimes do bad things or make bad decisions oh he's been through but, a bad amount of trauma exactly about what dal's been through and what gwen's been through mm-hmm. he himself has been through a massive mm-hmm. amount of trauma a lifetime of it that, you know you can right. that, if that happens now were you you guys say you said you you had this kind of already ready to go before anybody was involved so were you just like we're going to develop a star trek animated show and if somebody bites on it they bite and if not we just throw it away or like what was that like <laughs> okay, no, we we were, wanna, yeah. yeah we were really fortunate i mean uh secret hideout came to us 
because, um, you know, th they were familiar with Ninjago and Troll Hunters. And, you know, we did a lot of serialized television um, and for kids or animated. And yeah, they came to us and, you know, they had a great, Alex had a great idea of just like, you know, how do we create an entry point for kids into Star Trek? What's the, you know, like, what if we created a show that was just that nice on-ramp into the mm -hmm. greater universe? And um, they came to us with that, Colonel. And it was, um, you know, it was really intimidating at first. We we're like, oh boy, do we want to put our foot into this? Like, we're going to get killed. Like, how do you, you know, this is what I'm just so relieved by that so far people are liking it. Like, you know, I think they may have expected something a little lighter, a little younger, but then we kind of came in, we're like, well, we've done, we've done lighter. We want to go, we want to uh, yeah. go a little. I want a bigger mm -hmm. audience. You That's came in is, with yeah. the phasers set to stun and you were ready to Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but we know, but, but I feel like, but I feel like audiences, you know, you look at, okay, this is going to sound stupid, like talking about the toys <laughs> aspect of it, like the to like we've been involved with Legos and things like that. So we have certain knowledge, like the toy market, like is like six to eight. But if you're making a show for six to eight, that's going to feel young. But you look mm -hmm. at like Marvel, six year olds are watching Marvel, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. and, and Star Trek is like, it's not like you have bullets, you know, you have phasers. It's like, as long as we don't show blood and we, you know, like I, mm -hmm. You know, you look at there are some Star Trek episodes like we were just talking about the naked now on the next generation like they it was like their second episode after their pilot and everybody's getting naked and it's like just don't do that episode, you know, <laughs> that one. and you're already good. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. let's be real, the, the real people buying toys of Star Trek are the adults. Let's be honest, the minute Prodigy merch gets put on the line, on the shelves, it's going to be bought up by a lot of adults. The kids, you know, are, the gonna kids, the yeah. kids are going to be like, where's my toys? And we're going to yeah. just be like, you know, I'm going to have yeah, like a room full of kid. Murph. Yeah, sorry. And I, and yeah. Sorry. I'm building my proto star. But I want to yeah. say like Kevin and I, I think are, are good writers for this type of stuff. Cause it's like, we are geeks in terms of that stuff. We're not trying to mm. shill toys. We're not trying to like, you know, we're trying to create stuff that we want to buy to put on our shelves. Like that's, right. you know, we're, we're not ham fisting it into the show. We're making sure that it's organic and making sure that you love it. You know? Mm. Yeah. Who do you guys think is going to be the best selling toy character? Murph. That's sorry, what I what? think. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, That's something in my throat. Think... Which, which honestly, we had no idea. Like Murph, we came up with very late. We already mm -hmm. had the pilot kind oh, of. We had the pilot, and Murph was animatics, in and we felt like, oh, let's give him a pet. And then, mm -hmm. even once we had the character of Murph <laughs> in there, we went through all these designs, and Murph was really creepy at first. <laughs> Not very cute. <laughs> We wanted you know, Murph to be so ugly, he was adorable, like a like a pug or like a yeah, but, a targ, like a puppy targ. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah, it was really so. Never would have thought that people would have liked Murph until that final design we got. We're like this. Heather Kading's like, why don't we try to make him cute? And we're like, we were fighting it. We're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so, and then you get this great design and then you get D Bradley Baker doing the voices. And then, you know, so it was very <laughs> late in the game when we, yeah, when yeah. we realized this is, oh, this, this but I think that that speaks to the joy. Cause it's like, we try to mm -hmm. take ourselves so seriously about doing these, these shows, but then I think we got to a place. I'm like, well, when things get dark, all of a sudden you just got to cut to this little blobby guy and you're going to be like, you're going to perk back up and be like, this is yeah. fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm down for that. So, you know, we, we love Murph just as much as everybody else loves Murph. You also have Jake always... and Pog saying something funny as well. Mm -hmm. It's always <laughs> yeah. good to like, yes, don't stay too dark too long. It's a good ensemble mm -hmm. or you could have rock or yes. have something. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm, I'm instantly happy. You know, I'm like, I love rock when she gets excited about something. I'm like, I, you know, hearing Riley. Oh. Great. It's no secret that I'm a Riley fan. I I just I gush about her in every podcast and interview I do. I'm, I just love every delivery that she's done. So yeah. rock talks, my girl. <laughs> you were just talking about every time Riley does her little uh, sound mic thing, like, you, you know, like actors will be like tip of the tongue, lolly, lolly, twin, yeah. you know, they'll do these. And she'll be like, I like Skittles. My favorite color is blue. And I'm like, I just love it. And I'm like, if Rock eats anything outside of Nutri-Goop, I, yeah. I hope Skittles 
make it into the 24th century. <laughs> the <blue Skittles. laughs> I feel like Rock would love Skittles. Okay, no, I, so, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. So here's something I've been wanting to ask you guys, and because last night it took 10 episodes, but it reminded me of something. Um, and it reminded me of a show called Robotech. If you guys have ever seen or heard of Robotech, and the yeah, reason yeah, for I that, the models of Robotech and the mechs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. the cartoon I remember. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. and the reason it did was because I was thinking how impressed I was that you guys were making a very serialized, animated show. I mean, very serialized, you know. And that's something that Robotech did really well, and I really liked it as a kid. And I was wondering, you know, first of all, that's a, that's a pretty bold endeavor to make something so serialized you know because you never know somebody's just going to jump in on episode seven you know it still works they can still watch it and still enjoy it but you're very much every episode is kind of leading into the next episode leading into the next episode each episode has its own story as well but it's very serialized and i was wondering what what was what was your influence like what did you grow up with? did you watch cartoons what what were you watching that kind of influenced this Mm. Well, even with Robotech, I remember watching Robotech. Um, but the problem was, you know, on linear TV, it was before yeah. cable, I, they weren't in order. So mm -hmm. it was always like, or I couldn't watch TV every single morning. So I would just, mm -hmm. I enjoyed it, but I would always just get one episode. Mm -hmm. And it was always just a random story like, oh, they got to, they got to fly somewhere now. And I <laughs> totally lost it. And I would say like, we started doing this um, in Ninjago and it was a weird inspiration. It was right when I think I was binging The Wire or it could have been Game of Thrones was just starting back then. I'm like, why, why can't we do that for kids? You know, and, mm -hmm. and Lego at that point was like, we just want Scooby-Doo. We're like, okay, we'll do Scooby-Doo. But we totally lied and gave them like, we're like, we're gonna make an epic saga of ninjas and their elemental powers. And it's gonna be like <laughs> Star Wars. We, we felt like, we were so like we were so repressed. We were like repressed writers who have been trying so hard to get something produced, but it, like eight or nine years had gone by and nothing was getting made. That when we first had, got our first like bite of the meat, we we're like, we're gonna make this thing. We're we're gonna be George Lucas, and if they're gonna allow us to do it, we're gonna do that. And so yeah, that's that. We started that with Ninjago, and then that led to Troll Hunters, where we did fifty-two episodes straight before the first one ever aired. So we wrote a 52 episode arc, you know, which was crazy. Wow. And so, you know, these little 10 episode or 20 episode chunks that we're doing is, is, is easy peasy for us. That's, that's just the way we write. 20 episodes honestly, is still nuts though. Yeah. And honestly, like even that stems, that inspiration stems from, I remember uh, my dad talking about, you know, the old serials that would happen mm -hmm. before movies um, way longer. And Flash Gordon, Lone Ranger, mm -hmm. and you would just get this little short film, and it'd leave you on that cliffhanger, and then you'd have to go see the next MGM movie because it'd have another Lone Ranger bit, you know. So honestly, that was the start starting point in mind. But it, it always, but if you just do just a straight up cliffhanger, where some some of these episodes we know, like episode nine was a, a straight up cliffhanger. We don't mm -hmm. like the. I mean, I think that you want to get to a place where something feels wrapped up but then some, like like episode 10 things feel wrapped up but a new thing kind of pulls you to wanting to watch it more mm -hmm. nine and ten is just it's just it's such a big story you can't tell it in 22 and a half minutes you know it would feel yeah. real truncated um, yeah. i think that's i think you'll see a lot of two-part episodes in in prodigy going forward just because nice too hard to contain ourselves can i ask for something unconventional can i get up for 60 seconds of course <laughs> okay okay i don't know if can you puck does this I want, I want podcast reason. ever I want pause <laughs> yeah oh kevin i will yeah. carry this like i always do you get out of here Wait. <laughs> no, I, there's i have to get i just learned my daughter is about to go to a softball game or something and i have to i'm in charge of getting putting her dinner in the oven and kevin then, this kevin. is about the kids the kids are important it's about the like kids. Chris. It's it's all about seven. the kids it's Kevin, access. I'll take over. You go. Access, access. Access granted. <laughs> okay, 60 seconds. I'll be back. All right. All right. Let's, talk, let's talk about Kevin. 
<laughs> okay, now that he's gone, let me tell when you. He's gone. How is it like working yeah. with the brother? <laughs> You know, I'm actually, actually probably the person here who's watched the most Ninjago. Uh, I don't know about you, Ryan, yep. how much you've watched. No, but you I've definitely watched a lot have of watched more of it than I have. Okay. Uh, so when I first heard about it, I was like, no, it's Ninjago, Ninjago. They're like, no, it's Ninjago. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm having an argument with an eight-year-old, you know, like we're, we're arguing with each other. And I'm glad you corrected me. It is Ninjago. And I've, of course, learned that since. But... What I do like about that show, it is an interesting, just it, just Ninjago by itself is a very interesting show. Very good animated show. And the kids love it. My daughter loves yeah. it. I think she's watched every single episode. And her friends have watched almost. Oh, they're on like season thing. 15 right now. They're, they keep, like, we, we, yeah. we went up to like season yeah. 10. Yeah. Or something like that. It's, We're like, that's. We wrote every ninja adventure we possibly could. <laughs> we love it. We had our friend take yeah. it over. So yeah. Yeah. No, but that show is like it's very popular amongst kids. They just it goes hard. It. I'm, people think, oh, it's that little ninja show. Like ninjas are dying in that show. Like you gotta. There's some, you know, that's something that we've always like. People think Prodigy is serious. That stuff goes back to our roots. If you want, it's a little mm -hmm. younger, but it still has the same emotional impact. It has. It does. It does, and that's what it, it actually. That's where I can see kind of a similarity between that show and what you're doing with Prodigy, because it's not as kiddy as what you would expect out of Lego expect Ninja. Them, yeah. <laughs> they're they're actually talking about like real, you know, samurai values and 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 skills and and, and abilities and and you know this bigger uh, story that's happening. So yes. Well, we talk, yeah, we, we that was important to us in the sense it's not just like boys fighting. It's like they fight and yeah. then they there's consequences and they they're, they're looking at the emotional ramifications of it. And then, you know, right. um, that was a big part of it. You know, conflict Kevin's back, everybody. Kevin's back. Kevin's back. <laughs> yeah. yeah Vince and, back. And, and then on the flip side of that, you get something like Hotel Transylvania, which is like comedy right it's 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 more comedy it's it's you know it's yeah well i, I we, we were we were early writers in on that and and the, we were involved before adam sandler so ours was actually a okay. little bit more like um our version of our draft was a little bit more like the incredibles of like has been monsters mm -hmm. and um hmm. yeah yeah it was a little different it didn't have the, the adam sandler zing to it but but still, you you guys have created these franchises that continue to live on, and 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 people still love and respect, and it just indicative of uh, the kind of foundational work that you put into these characters and these stories. That even when you walk away from it, somebody else is able to pick up on it and 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 keep it going. Um, so you know, kudos to you. But I guess. You know, did you guys decide to go into writing like at the same time or did one of you drag the other one into it? <laughs> we, we were different. Kevin, why don't you speak I, on that, Kevin? I'm a couple of years older. So I grew up, you know, Dan and I, we grew up in Oregon and we were playing with Legos. It was raining a lot outside. So we were mm. doing stuff indoors, we watching the movies, going, going to the theater all the time. But uh, my dad, our dad got a video camera and I just started, we started filming videos and they just started to get more and more elaborate and suddenly special effects and this and that. And, you know, and uh, I would always put my little brother in the movies and then, <laughs> you know, and then, yeah, it just started to get, it kept going. I went to film school and he would start composing the music for my shorts. Yeah, I, I got big into music. And we thought like our way, and we were like Oregonians wanting to get into movies. And we thought the way in was Kevin was going to direct and I was going to do music for his movies. And then Kevin came to like, it was funny, like the one, the, the, like everything's all up and up. And then Kevin like has this epiphany. He's like, well, who's going to give me a million dollars to make a movie? And I was like, God, Kevin, why would you say that? How am I going to get, who's going to hire me to do music? And like, it's like all of our dreams crashed down in just that one moment of life. <laughs> and so, so I, that moment, like, I think we got to write. We, we should write something. Right? Yeah, I go, Dan, 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 I know I went to film school. I took one screenwriting class. We're like, we're not writers. Not, and I didn't even take it seriously. I didn't even try. I, I got like a passing grade because I was like, oh. I'm not going to be a writer. I'm going to be a director. But then- yeah. 
once, you know, after that, after film school and stuff and realizing, well, God, I got to teach myself how to write. I started uh, printing out my favorite screenplays from Steven Spielberg and Christopher Columbus and Robert Zemeckis. And usually a lot of that Amblin sort of movies that yeah. came out of the eighties. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I would read those and go, okay, this is how they did it. And I would try to mimic it, you know, and Dan, I'd give my scripts to Dan and Dan would like give me story notes. And he's like, this is kind of fun. Like, what if we did it together? And I'm like, okay. And <laughs> it got better, you know? Wow. Yeah. Now, uh, guys, I know uh, we just have about a minute or two left before we have to run. But uh, before we go, this has been a really impressive and almost completely unexpected ride. Uh, it's been we expected it. No, just trust. see, but we, but we did. We're like, oh, so it's a new anime thing. Let's see no, what happens. I will say and we our watched it. We're like, what the hell? We this all is love amazing. It. We love these characters. So we're just like, you know, we can't, we couldn't wait for them to come out of the bag. So. Mm. So we love it. What what can we look forward to in the second half? Um, I know you can't tell us actual details, but is there anything that you can tell us for everybody that's going like, well, now we have to wait X amount of months before the next ones? Well, I think we can say because you've seen the final tag of episode 10, the real mm -hmm. Janeway enters, right? And we just thought, yeah. what a great way what a fun, conflict-filled way to meet Starfleet if Starfleet is hunting them down. If Starfleet mm -hmm. doesn't know who they are, they just know that there's this stolen ship. They don't care. They got hearts of gold. <laughs> and yeah. they, and, you know, they want their ship back. The ship can never go close to Starfleet or else bad things are going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. That's a charged you know, interesting, you know, and, and the back 10 where we were very inspired by uh, the fugitive, you know, I yeah, love the movie Red October because mm -hmm. I love or the hunt for red October. I love Harrison Ford in the fugitive. Cause you know, he's this guy, this doctor who's been unjustifiably screwed over and he's on the run yeah. trying to like protect his name. Right. And then you got Tommy Lee Jones. Who's not a bad guy. Like you love the Tommy Lee Jones scenes. Mm. He's just hunting mm -hmm. them now. He's just doing his job just trying to catch this guy. Yeah, right? I didn't do it. I guy. don't care. And so I'm like, that's, <laughs> yeah. what a great mom. that's Janeway. She's going to be hunting them down. She doesn't mm -hmm. know the truth yeah. of these kids. And she's just trying to do the Starfleet way. And I will say this. I mean, the first 10 episodes is really about introducing these characters and getting them onto this mm -hmm. journey. It's like the first act. And the most fun in a movie is the beginning of the second act. And this is kind of like the beginning of the second act. So like, whereas, I mean, I thought episode eight, I thought was the best one. Like I remember early on, I was like, I always had that episode eight, eight as pegged, but mm -hmm. the episodes coming up are just as good, if not better. Like there, there, there's some, there's some bangers coming out. There's some good ones where we can't wait. <laughs> I, I, for this next batch, I'll say 18 is amazing. Oh boy. Kevin, that's the, yeah. Bonnie probably. There's a bunch of good ones. I love yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I uh, have my nothing. Question, <laughs> I, my question is, at the end of this next, these next 10, are we going to see everybody kind of fall into uh, place as far as, you know, science officer, engineer, secure? Is that going to start it's to... It's a growth. I will say it's a growth. I think we're, 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 yeah. we're trying to take our time because I don't, okay. I don't want to go too fast. It's, it's okay. the enjoyment is the journey of watching them. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm like, and I just yeah. want to second that time amok <laughs> is freaking brilliant. It's a brilliant name oh. and it's a brilliant concept. Yeah. And when Ciroc was talking about how there's diagrams out there, I was specifically thinking of when they had the diagram of, the time yes. uh, thing. And I'm sure Sirach did too, when he mentioned that, cause that was really cool. It actually helped us to understand. We're like, Oh, okay. I can see it now. I get it. You know, even though it's for kids, yeah, we're, we're like, trying, we're, like we're, trying to out, <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to explain to Nickelodeon. We're like, we don't want them shutting it down. We're like, trust us. It works. It's, it's going to be great. They'll get it. Don't coming from up. a coming, coming from a music background. It was so nice to see. It was like, you know, explaining it like a sound wave. It was yeah. just so nice to, to see a visual, that um and kids are learning stuff like that in school mm -hmm. so little visuals like that that are linking it to what they're learning today as well probably gets them more excited about science too now they're going to be sitting in class 
seeing a, a you know a graph like this going ah oh, it's like in prodigy yeah, it's like like it's yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah just like episode eight well everybody <laughs> we are just about out of time here but we want to give a huge thank you to dan and kevin hageman not just for giving us your time and your insights today but also for carrying the torch for star trek and giving us something new to enjoy and talk about and a new generation to uh, really dive into this franchise that we love. We really appreciate it. So, well, thank you guys. so much. Yeah, thank I you. I just want to say phone. really, oh, so sorry. I, can't, oh, I, I have a delay on say, my phone. Hold on. Oh, oh, your phone's about to die? No, I have a delay. <laughs> so like every time oh. I I'm like, I, so I feel bad. I feel like I keep talking over everyone because I'm no, I, I, it's I, like I delayed say, back. I want to say thank you to, to you guys for loving the show and sharing your love for the show. I mean, it's like, you know, we feel like we're this little show on Paramount Plus, and yes, there's a big Star Trek audience, but it's great for people like you saying, hey, watch this show. It's not just for kids. So thank you guys for that. Absolutely. We're happy to do it. And Bonnie, I know and, where you're going with this because we feel the same yes, way. But well, yes and no. I just want to thank Dan and Kevin because, <laughs> um, you know, I came into the project way in the beginning, like with callbacks and, and auditions for Gwen. And they were always just so kind and wonderful to work with. And I got to do scratch and, you know, work with the team and just get, they just were so generous with their, you know, letting me in and letting me enjoy the stories with them and, you know, taking a chance on me as well. So thank you guys for letting me be a part of this amazing show and for, make me be a part of your ridiculously fun dysfunctional family so thank you it's it's such an bonnie, honor to be on the show yeah it would not and be the same without you bonnie so you're thank you enjoy. Thank, thank you, you. Yeah. it's been so and much I, fun and it, yeah and closing i'll say you know uh we ha we're watching a lot of star trek reviewing shows so we're watching all star trek pretty much across the board stuff that's current and in the past and it's a pleasure to be able to look forward each time and say, I know I'm going to get a quality episode when I watch yeah. this show. And mm -hmm. that's not the case with everything. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased at what you guys have done so far because you've really kept me entertained. And I think that you're dealing with very serious issues when it comes to um, the fragility of childhood and self-doubt and growing and you're approaching those topics with the with the kind of tenacity that I think is going to benefit a lot of children out there and and be instructive and educational about how they can overcome things and deal with challenges and obstacles in their own life. So thank you guys uh, for joining us and talking about the show. And I continue the the good work. And you know we're rooting for you. We're, we're really rooting thank for you. you. Anytime you want us back, just let us know. We'll be here. Well, that answers my thank question, then. We really appreciate that. We have to give a super <laughs> quick, very special thank you to Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet, TJ Jackson, Bay yep. out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin, uh, Yvette Blackman, Tom Homer Freezy <laughs> out somewhere in New Yeezy, Eve England out in Wales, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Titus Moeller, Tim Baum, Darlena Marie, John Mann, Rex A. Wood, Dr. Wood. Muhammad Noor, Joe Balserati, Tierney C. Diekman, Ed Maurer, Anil O. Palat, Anil K. Chandler, Anil. Uh, Thomas Collings, Lawrence Niels, uh, Isaac Stock, Ed Jarrett, and of course, very special thanks to Dr. Susan Dr. B. Gruner. Sue. We really appreciate you guys. Um, Bonnie, we really appreciate the time that we've had with you, Thank and we you. hope to see you soon. In fact, we know that we will. More on that later. Dan and Kevin, we really appreciate it. Can't wait to see you again. Thank you, guys. Thanks yeah, very thank much. You, and guys. everybody at home, Watch Prodigy. Tell all your friends to watch Prodigy. There's no excuse. It's the best thing in the world, basically. And always remember the seventh rule.